Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. My name is Ria Aguinaldo. I am an Outreach Manager with Small Business Majority. We're happy, very happy to bring this webinar to you today on National Women's Small Business Month. This webinar is, webinar is entitled Tools for Women Businesses. Now within the next hour, we're going to go over some tips, tools, and programs to help you as you're starting and growing your women-owned business. Um, we're very excited to bring this webinar to you in partnership with Axion U.S. Network who we partner with across the country. They are a community development financial institution, which we'll hear a little bit more about uh, later in the presentation. We're going to go over a great deal of information today, but just to note, we will make the slide deck available to all of you. And here are the topics that we will discuss. So I will hand it over to Lauren Rosenbaum, who is with Axion. She will give us a high level overview of women entrepreneurship in the U.S. There's, there's much promise in women-owned businesses and women entrepreneurs that are really leading the charge here with entrepreneurship. So I just wanted to give some, some background about that information to all of you. And then we'll dive into specific topics around women entrepreneurship. So I will talk about Access to Capital 101, funding options to start and grow your business. Then I'll hand it over to Felina Hansen with Hera Hub, who is a women entrepreneur based in San Diego, and she will discuss keys to building a scalable business. And then we'll hand it over to Dina Grossman, who is with Spinning J Bakery and Soda Fountain out in Chicago. And she'll talk about her experience in growing her business and give us some specific marketing tips for growing your small business. And then we will round out the presentations with resources and tools, and then we'll end out with a question and answer portion. So if you do have any questions, please feel free to type them in the chat box in the lower left-hand corner of your screen, and we will get to those at the end. Now with that, I'll go ahead and hand it over to Lauren Rosenbaum with Axion, who will talk about women entrepreneurship in the U.S. Lauren, go ahead and take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Ria. Um, thank you, everyone, for having me here. I wanted to start today's presentation uh, with just a few facts about women entrepreneurship in the United States. Uh, so right now, women are really the key drivers of entrepreneurship in our country. They're founding businesses at two and a half times the national rate, um, and actually most of that growth is driven by women of color. For example, between 1997 and 2014, the number of businesses owned by black or African American women has grown by almost 300%. Um, and women business owners are really part of the movement in our country. They are making our economy and our communities better for everyone. So one interesting fact is that companies with gender and ethnic diversity on their leadership teams um, are more profitable than those that have less diversity. Um, and women-owned businesses are creating employment in their communities. Uh, the vast majority of women business owners plan to hire full-time employees in the next year. Um, and women-owned businesses are also more actively involved in their communities than male-owned businesses. So these are just a few of the reasons why at Axiom we're so fortunate to partner with women-owned businesses across the country. Um, just a little bit about who we are. We are a nonprofit business lender. Um, our average loan size um, for the first for a first-time loan is about ten thousand um, dollars, and we offer a really broad range of loan sizes and types depending on the individual business need. Um, we pride ourselves on the fact that we really take a holistic approach to lending. We consider a broad variety of factors um, about an individual business and their potential um, beyond the traditional measures like FICO score. Uh, we really want to know, um, you know what makes you unique and what makes you um, uh, have the potential to grow. Um, and we also pride ourselves in the fact that we partner with entrepreneurs every step of the way. That starts with the loan process um, and the application process itself. Uh, we have expert loan consultants across the country who are available to help you put your loan application together, put your best foot forward from the beginning. Um, and we also offer business resources. Um, we have online an online 
library of resources, articles, videos, um, webinars, and we also have events uh, across the country. We have workshops, um, networking events, mentorship programs. Um, and then the last thing that really we're proud of is that Axiom is a national community, and most of the people who we um, fund are not only invested in their own success, but they're invested in helping other business owners succeed as well. So many of our clients will serve as speakers at our national events, um, our webinars, our local events. They'll serve as mentors to other business owners, um, and they'll serve uh, you know, as, as panelists, and they'll even um, often collaborate with each other on business ventures. So a recent example that comes to mind is um, one of our restaurant clients recently started serving food at another client who owns a distillery business. And that partnership started when they met at an Axiom networking event. Um, and we know that the approach that we take is successful because since 1991, when we started lending in the U.S., 97% uh, of the businesses that we funded have remained open. Uh, and so this uh, information, uh, as Rhea said, will be available for you after the webinar. Um, but if you're interested in learning more about Axiom, I encourage you to visit our website. Um, it will prompt you to enter your zip code um, so that you can get the correct uh, regional um, information, contact information to learn more. And you can also check out our general inquiries line um, at 1-888-705-4615. Um, and if you're simply interested in um, starting your own business or building your business, um, we have business resources available. And I also encourage you to check out our workshops and events page and see if there's anything coming up uh, near you. So thank you again for having me. With that, I will turn it back over to Rhea. Thank you, Lauren. Okay, wonderful. Now, Axion, um, we partner with Axion across the country, not only on this webinar, but also with um, in-person um, and online uh, seminars on access to capital as well. So I definitely encourage you to check them out. Um, they, have, they have offices across the country as well. So now I will go into Access to Capital 101, Funding Options to Start and Grow Your Business. Now for this, uh, for this special webinar, I'm going to present a sort of uh, abbreviated version of our, our entire uh, education here. Um, but just to note, uh, we do host this particular uh, topic uh, biweekly through a webinar. So if you're interested in, in seeing the entire presentation, We'll plug that at the end, um, and we will have that up on one of the resource slides here. This portion of the presentation is brought to you um, and is sponsored by the Sam's Club Giving Program. Now, just a quick background about Small Business Majority. We are a small business education and advocacy organization. We are celebrating our 10-year anniversary this year. We have offices across the country, and in each of those regions we have outreach managers that focus specifically on um, working with business owners on the ground and finding out what the particular challenges within that region um, and within those um, sort of industries um, and finding out how we can as an organization um, continue to advocate for and continue to bring education to small businesses. We are focused on finding out what the top line issues of small business are, um, for us, time and time again, access to capital has continued to come up as one of the key challenges that small business owners, especially women entrepreneurs, face in growing their business. Um, and that from, really from that um, type of research, we uh, put together our, our, our new entrepreneurship program that focuses on the education. So our entrepreneurship program brings resources and education to small business owners in key areas of running and growing a small business. Um, all of the information that I will go over in my slides is available at our Small Business Access to Capital Resource Portal. Um, and we do have other information uh, around financing options that I, that I won't cover um, in this presentation as well. So just quickly wanted to go over just a few slides on, on the background. 
why are we here talking about access to capital and what are the challenges that small business owners face? Um, as I mentioned, you know, inadequate access to capital continues to be the top issue. And in terms of the need, um, the need has stayed the same. So for, for entrepreneurs across the board, having that accessibility, the availability of capital continues to be crucial at all stages of business whether it's working capital, whether it's renovation or um, real estate, making sure that that capital is there and, um, and, and accessible is, is very important. Um, but, but the challenges around that, you know, what are the issues? So for one, uh, small business bank lending is down 20% since before the Great Recession. Um, it wasn't more than a decade ago when a small business could walk into their local bank, um, talk to a banker, uh, and within a couple of weeks to a month um, have, uh, have that, that loan ready for use. Um, unfortunately, trying to change, um, there are a number of reasons that um, play into that um, decline. Uh, there are also a couple of, of reasons including um, consolidation of community banks. Um, Post-Great Recession, we are also seeing that many small business owners are still sort of pulling out of that financial um, downturn, um, now suffering from devalued uh, credit scores, um, suffering from a lack of collateral, and in today's day and age in terms of lending are essentially less credit worthy by, by today's strict underwriting standards. So all of that to say, um, if you had challenges finding capital, if you've been turned down by a bank, um, you've been sort of uh, knocking on doors looking for funding, you are not alone. Um, many small business owners are, are really facing that same struggle. And so what we're hoping to do is just provide a high-level overview of what are the options out there? You know, are there new alternative options? Which options should I be looking into? And hopefully we can just provide you with that sort of um, high-level overview so that you can have a starting point to, um, to reach out to now that you um, are looking for that necessary financing. Okay. Now the odds are uh, the lending is tight for small businesses, but really odds are even worse for specific populations, women and minority owned businesses in particular. Uh, as Lauren mentioned um, in, in her couple of slides here, there are a number of unique challenges that women and minority owned firms face. First off, they do smart start smaller in size. They start with less capital. Um, we do see lower approval rates in terms of bank loans and often at smaller dollar amounts. Um, and, and due to specific socioeconomic, um, uh, cultural, or linguistic barriers, um, women and minority owned businesses are more vulnerable to predatory lending. Uh, and so what that really means for us is that it's really important for us to um, provide more tailored, um, that there are more programs and education and, and technical assistance, quite frankly, that are geared towards one-on-one -on -one assistance, making sure that women and minorities get um, that, um, that unique and um, much needed uh, support. Okay. Now moving on to important questions to consider. Now what I want to just quickly go over here is there are new and innovative funding options out there, um, but the first step, so the crucial first step before even looking into sources of financing is a critical evaluation of your business's financial situation. So taking the extra time to look into these questions and ask yourself, how much money do you actually need? What do you need it for? Um, realistically asking yourself how long will it take you, will it take you to pay back that financing? Um, making sure that you take a, a holistic look at who you are as a business and also take a look at your personal finances as well. Um, in doing so and making sure that you're looking at, at all, of, um, all of these questions, it will really help you to, to lead you to that financing source that will essentially help to, to work in hand in hand with your business plan and will work with the growth of your company. Um, too many times we've, we've spoken to business borrowers that 
um, were as often as often we hear that were sort of backed up against a wall. They really needed that short-term financing, and they just needed it a couple of months ago. And so the option that they they sort of fell into was the one that was very expensive. You know, wasn't realistic for them, and they sort of dug themselves into a hole. Um, because of that, um, the short term turnaround that they, they needed that financing. So at this point, I just wanted to also plug um, there are a number of organizations that help um, entrepreneurs on the ground. So there are small business development centers, there's technical assistance organizations, and there are also specific women's business centers. These are organizations that are funded partly by the U.S. Small Business Administration. Um, and they have business coaches, business counselors that can go through these questions with you, or go through your business plan with you, um, and make sure that you have that extra support that you need. Okay. All right. Now the good news is that there are more options than ever before. Now I wanted to put this slide up just to give you a snapshot of some of the traditional and alternative options that are available on the market. Um, just to get you start, just to get you thinking about where potentially you could uh, you could reach out to for financing. I won't go over all of these options here, and in no way is this an extensive list. But just wanted to, to let you know that that is um, one of the the benefits of our new day and age in terms of lending is that the options are now have now really expanded. And in particular, these are some of the options that we, um, that we go over, Small Business Majority, in our Access to Capital 101 presentation. Um, what I do want to go over is just a couple of options here, um, just to keep it pretty high level, but I think um, in terms of um, just a, a basic understanding of what's out there, we'll just walk you through a couple of these options. And so we wanted to start with here Community Development Financial Institutions or CDFIs. Now CDFIs are, um, are organizations and entities that are certified by the U.S. Treasury Department. So they can be nonprofits. They can be um, community banks. Uh, and, and essentially what CDFIs have, um, have stepped in to fill the void uh, of bank lending that um, was created and they are focused traditionally uh, specifically on uh, geographic regions. So CDFIs will raise the capital that they lend or invest through grants or through low interest loan funds um, to focus on really revitalizing specific regions. Um, Axion is a CDFI and they're a network, they have a network of um, CDFI branches across the country. A um, couple of benefits about CDFIs is uh, in terms of the borrowers that they serve, they really take a holistic approach in terms of looking at, at your um, – at a holistic approach in terms of underwriting. So what they'll do is they'll look beyond just the credit score and they'll look beyond just the collateral and take a look at your business model, take a look at who you are as a business and sort of your, um, your growth potential and they will really get to know who you are as, an, as a company um, in order to, um, to make that loan to you and uh, determine sort of uh, uh, credit, credit worthiness. A couple of other benefits, CDFIs often do pair their funding with mentorship and other technical assistance support. Oftentimes we do see CDFIs will um, make it a requirement to attend specific um, uh, financial education workshops just so that they sort of understand that um, you know what they're getting into in terms of the financing. You have that ability to repay and that you're better suited in terms of long term, um, uh, in terms of uh, positioning yourself for long term growth as a business owner with that loan. Many CDFIs also offer microloan programs that are loans of less than 50000 For many business owners, we do see that microloan programs are very beneficial since for the most part many businesses look for that smaller loan size which is not often available at uh, most of the big banks. Okay. 
All right. Now, in the rest of my time here, I wanted to talk about alternative online lenders. Now, um, this is a very, very big topic, and we could spend very a lot of time on this. But what I wanted to do is just introduce a new um, new lending opportunities that are being expanded, sort of changing the the horizon in terms of lending for small businesses. Uh, in terms of alternative online lenders, this is often referred to as financial technology, fintech. Um, there's a huge movement now of, of, uh, of online options and online financing uh, solutions that are geared towards entrepreneurship. And so in terms of alternative online lenders, what you see on a simple streamlined application process is um, quick approval and delivery of funds, which does sort of shift that um, the traditional underwriting for for big banks or um, many other lenders that are sort of paper driven. The use of technology and new sources of data assess risk, uh, and in particular here, really important to note that many of these online lenders have alternative payment structures. So unlike many of the traditional lending options that are out there that have stated ATRs and, and um, specific monthly payments, what we do see now is alternative online lenders have new payment structures which could include daily payments, could be weekly payments. Um, and so just on that point, it's really important to note that while there are some responsible options out online and that some of these newer benefits such as the speed and the, the quick approval can be beneficial for some businesses, um, it can be oftentimes difficult to um, tell the um, responsible options from some of the options that might end up being more expensive for, for entrepreneurs. So it's really important to note here that please, if you are looking into alternative online options, please proceed with caution. Make sure that you take that extra time to um, go those extra steps in and understand what the payment structures are. Make sure that you know the total cost of the loan. Um, and we'll go through some of those other tips um, in uh, the next couple of slides here. Okay. All right. Now what I wanted to do here is go over just a couple of online lenders. The first is called Online Marketplace Lenders. They are peer-to-peer -peer lenders who have quickly come into this space offering capital to small business owners. The way that the financing works for um, Online marketplace lenders is on the front end. Um, you as a small business borrower would apply for a loan um, through your computer. And on the back end when you apply for that loan, what that peer-to-peer -peer lender does is they connect you with institutional and in individual investors. Essentially what the loan looks like is it's often called a, an online term loan because the way that it's structured is similar to a traditional bank loan. Um, it has stated, uh, stated APR. It's fixed um, multi-year term. Funding Circle is an example of an online marketplace lender as well as um, Prosper and Lending Club. Online cash flow lenders are another type of online lender. They are generally focused on offering short-term loans, typically for working capital. Now when I talk about alternative payment structures, this is really important to note about online cash flow lenders, is that the payments made for online cash flow lenders are made on a daily basis. They um, are offered, or they, in terms of how that money is taken out, these lenders require access to your business bank account, and they will actually take that, um, those payments out on a daily basis, a fixed amount or a percentage of sales. So rather than setting an interest rate, um, that would be um, sort of made on a daily basis, um, and, and that's how those payments would be made directly through your, your bank account. In terms of online cash flow lenders, please be aware that oftentimes it can be confusing to understand what those payments will actually result to. So please be aware that they are often opaque pricing. Um, we often do see that time, at times there is a sort of lack of transparency in terms of, um, of uh, how that loan is presented to you. So please take the time to look into, um, into these options. And also online, um, please visit a business coach or a business counselor. Or if you are considering these options, I think it's, 
it's a pretty good practice to visit with a, a CDFI or another lender who can give you a, a, their view on um, what that would look like for your business. All right. Now I'll close out here with uh, just a, a quick overview of our Small Business Borrowers Bill of Rights. Um, before I turn it over to Felina. So what we have noticed as an advocacy organization is that a number of alternative online lenders, which I just spoke about a couple of, have stepped into the space and they're failing a void through high cost and short term online funding options. For a, a really long time we did not know how big the growth of the industry was. We just sort of um, from a um, advocacy and a um, uh, a small business resource organization perspective, we knew that there are a number of small business owners that were getting themselves into loans that were not often responsible, would sometimes really um, bury them into a very high level of debt, and there were a number of concerns that have um, really came out of um, looking into the industry. So what we have done as an organization is we've uh, partnered with a um, coalition of nonprofits, for-profit lenders, credit marketplaces, and brokers with the hope of making sure that small business owners um, have specific fundamental rights when it comes to lending, and particularly to online lending, and making sure that as this industry grows that we can sort of set guardrails in terms of um, what small business owners deserve. So with that, we put together the Small Business Borrowers Bill of Rights. And if you are interested in learning more about the Bill of Rights, we do have a website. It's responsiblebusinesslending.org. Essentially what the Borrowers Bill of Rights is, is it lays out the parameters in terms of what small business borrowers deserve. So all of you on the line here, please, please note that these are rights that you should um, that that you all deserve in terms of the lending products that you have. Unfortunately, many of the online lenders, um, the industry as a whole is highly unregulated. So, unlike what you'll get at traditional lending options at CDFIs, at community banks, or um, at traditional banks, many of those consumer protections that are worked into those products are unfortunately not at this point worked into online lending. So what we have done is we have come together hopefully putting more, more accountability, mo working more transparency into these options. So we put together this borrower's uh, Bill of Rights checklist. So these are questions that you should be asking yourself as you are looking into really any loan product. Um, what is the interest rate? Is the interest rate clearly disclosed? Um, are there any prepayment penalties? That's a very, very important one as we see that some of the, the, the short-term um, merchant cash advance options that are essentially cash up front um, paid back on a daily basis. Often if you pay that off um, in advance, you'll have a very, very high prepayment penalty. Essentially just ask yourself um, and bring these questions as well to your business coach, to someone that can help you look at what these options um, really cost you over the long term. All right, now this is the last slide here. Uh, this is the organization that helped to develop the Borrowers Bill of Rights. We encourage other organizations and other lenders, brokers, and marketplaces to join us. Um, please take a look at our website, um, responsiblebusinesslending.org, if you are interested in learning more. Now with that, I will go ahead and now turn it over to Felina. Um, we have Felina Hansen who is the founder of Hera Hub. Uh, Felina is a longtime entrepreneur and marketing maven. Um, she has three locations in San Diego County and she's expanding nationally. Uh, we're very excited to have her on the line to talk about building a scalable business. So with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you, Felina. Great. Thank you so much, Ria. Let's make sure I can get the slide up here. Perfect. Awesome. Well, I am really excited to share a bit of my journey as an entrepreneur. I've actually been an entrepreneur now going on 14 years. And I didn't become an entrepreneur because I had a great idea. Um, actually, my first entrepreneurial journey was at age 30 
And it came because I was working in marketing mostly in small high-tech startups and got laid off three times by the age of 30. (laughs) And so came into my entrepreneurial path uh, more so by force a bit. Uh, But now that I've been a small business owner for close to 14 years, I really could never go back to (laughs) having a J-O-B, as I call it. So Um, In my short time here, I'm going to talk about the things I've learned in building my current business. This is now my second business uh, in scaling that business. So my first business was a marketing strategy firm. I worked with a lot of professional services companies. I had that business for eight years, and it was great, but it was me, myself, and I, and some subcontractors. It was, unless I wanted to just add employees and headcount, it wasn't exactly a scalable business. So with my current business, which I'll explain what that is here in a moment, um, it really was top of mind the day I started, the day I came up with the concept to build something that was bigger than myself. And that's what I'm going to lead you through in this discussion here is what are those things that I learned along the way um, to build something that I could grow to scale and, and how I did that. So uh, so the, the seven principles, um, really, the, the first one primarily is obviously a foundational decision. And if any of you have uh, read the book Purple Cow by Seth Godin, it is one of my favorites. It's a business book that's been around for quite some time, but it's a principle that still, of course, rings true, which is you need to have an original idea. And I live in the world of entrepreneurs. I, I, I founded and run these co-working spaces here in California. And again, as Rhea mentioned, we're expanding nationally and internationally. I really get to know a lot of small business owners through our community. And we've got folks that, that come to us, and they're kind of doing a me too type of product or service. So, you know, it, it's kind of copying what's already out there. And to build something that's scalable, ideally you have something that's unique. It doesn't mean you're reinventing the wheel, but it's taking a spin on something that's perhaps already out there, but doing it differently or serving a different market. So the example here (laughs) is an executive suite. So again, I'm the founder of a co-working space, a shared workspace. We do focus on supporting female entrepreneurs specifically, although we have some awesome male members as well. But this image I'm showing you here is kind of the traditional office, right? Uh, executive suite where you have a receptionist and you know you come in and it's a bunch of little tiny offices and a long hallway and everybody goes into their own office. Really, the inherent business model is privacy. And these have been around for a long time. Regis is the largest executive suite company in the world. Um, And so their inherent business model is selling you privacy, right? Work outside of your home, but don't have to leave the whole office space, have your own private space. The opposite end of the spectrum, this growing market of co-working spaces that are really prolific here in the U.S., but also globally, has really emerged with the growth of the technology scene. So co-working officially is only about nine, ten years old. Um, But this is an image of some of the co-working spaces around the country. Really cool, really hip. I always like to say, you know, ping pong tables and beer kegs and, you know, really very, uh, again, hip places to be. But um, it wasn't kind of my tribe, if you will, as I was looking for my own personal business. So this is the world I lived in for eight years when I had my marketing strategy company, the home office. And I'm sure many of you work out of your home office. It's obviously cost-effective and convenient. But there's uh, some challenges that come with that, um, and as, as evidenced by some of the images here. So when I went to create my own purple cow, my own you know, original concept or spin on what was out there, both spectrums of you know, kind of that old school executive suite to the new school technology co-working space, I decided to create a space that was considerably different and targeted a different demographic, which I'll talk about in a second. So here are a couple images. Uh, an image of the space and an image of some of our members. 
the top image is Hera Labs, which is our business accelerator program. It's a separate entity. It's a nonprofit. Um, and that organization is run through primarily grants through economic development, and also um, we've been fortunate to get the grant through the SBA two years in a row for the accelerator programs. And then the image below is our co-working space, one of our three locations here in San Diego. So second thing I've learned in my journey is definitely, as I like to say, find your tribe. And this has been the case for Hera Hub. It is identifying a segment of the market that wasn't being served. So again, we focus on supporting primarily female entrepreneurs, a lot of solopreneurs. Uh, it has been said that 90% of women, female small business owners, don't have any employees. So therefore, by default, as we call them, they are solopreneurs um, that really, truly need support. They need community. They're looking and craving for community. And so this concept of Finding our tribe, our members here at Hera Hub, really, again, kind of follows that uh, thought process that was in one of my other favorite business books by Malcolm Gladwell called Outliers, is really looking at, as you think about your business concept, how can you serve a market that isn't being served, that's being ignored? A shared workspace is certainly nothing new, but what could I do to put a different spin on it, but also serve a demographic that was, again, being ignored. These women, solopreneurs, freelancers, contractors, our members range from this woman who's looking back in the picture, Vivian Sayward, she had a career in biotech and one day said, I'm over it, and started a women's golfware line that she manufactures here in Southern California. So uh, we've got a good number of folks that are in professional services, attorneys, CPAs, marketing professionals, and a, a very big segment of social enterprise and nonprofit organizations. So that takes me to tip number three. And this is something that I, I am going to say I think can be easier for women than men based on my experience is being vulnerable as you're building your tribe. You know, I think kind of the old mindset of doing business is, um, you know, very, how do I want to say this? Um, you know, everything's great all the time. You know, we're firing on all cylinders, you know, full steam ahead, whatever <laughs> cliches you want to use. Whereas now I think, as, as was said earlier, women are starting businesses you know, two to three times faster than the market rate. More women are coming into business ownership and being willing to be open and vulnerable to share the failures, so to speak. At Hera Hub, we, we do an event called uh, Pivot Pub, as we call it, where we get together once a month and just talk about how, how do we handle failure? How do we pivot? How do we you know, come up with a new way of doing things. So my vulnerable, <laughs> um, one of many vulnerabilities in business was I went down the path of expansion, scaling my business initially through a franchise model. And I did that for two years and ultimately found that the market that I was targeting, uh, women in other cities who perhaps want to bring this platform for female entrepreneurship, this physical workspace and business accelerator to their city, were actually kind of turned off by even just the connotation of franchising. It, it you know, kind of has this, you know, McDonald's, Burger King, you know, quick serve food uh, connotation to it. And, you know, in all truthfulness, we went down that path. I spent a, a good amount of money um, getting franchise approved, so to speak. It's a state-by-state -state scenario. It's a ton of lawyers involved in the process. And we got two years into it. We sold our first location in Washington, D.C., which is now open. Um, but I realized as more folks came to the table, they were just turned off by the idea of franchising, frankly. And so earlier this year, we pivoted to a licensing model, and that has made all the difference. And I've been very open and transparent about, you know what, 
we went down this path. It didn't work. Thank goodness uh, the tech world uses the word pivot every 10 minutes because I now use it. And so, you know, you don't have to say I failed. You can just say, hey, I went down this path. It didn't work, and here's the path I'm going down now. One, one of many pivots we've made in business, and that will be my final point here. So uh, number four, really thinking about how can you assist your tribe in making their dreams come true. So I'm going to give you a couple examples here. What I want you to think about, and I have this conversation with so many small business owners, and it's interesting, um, a, a lot of them have never thought about this. But I want you to think about, are you selling, whether it's a product or a service, are you selling a vitamin or are you selling a painkiller? And very, very brief example um, that anybody can relate to, let's say you're having a dinner party and you have 30 people showing up to your house. It's 4 p.m. and they're coming at 7, and you have a pipe break in your house and you have water gushing everywhere. That plumbing company that you're calling to come out at 4 o'clock on a Saturday afternoon, they're selling a painkiller, right? That's something you absolutely 1,000% need. But unfortunately, not all of us can come up with painkiller product or service. A lot of times we're looking at something that's more, this would be a nice to have. And the example I want to give here is actually of one of our members, a woman named Nicole McDonald. She has a product called the Sash Bag, and this is a purple cow product she created. There's a little image. You can kind of see the, the lady standing there hand in hand with her Sash Bag. That's kind of the 21st century fanny pack, as we call it. And, you know, not everybody in the market is going to be drawn to this product, right? This is a very niche product. This, mostly your customers are busy moms who need their hands free and they don't want to wear a fanny pack. <laughs> and there is that small segment of the market where she is selling <laughs> painkillers to that, that segment of the market. So what I want you to think about in your business is, is that segment, who is that customer, who is that tribe who sees your product or service as a painkiller and how can you continue to focus on people like that, find more painkiller customers as opposed to trying to be all things to all people? All right, moving on. <laughs> this is one of my favorites. And so many small business owners I know hate selling. We talk about this so often at Hera Hub. Everybody loves marketing, but, but most folks, you know, when you say the word sales, they don't get as excited. And so what I like to encourage and what we do here at Hera Hub is thinking about how can you lead, how can you be a leader in your industry, in your business, in your market, where you actually don't have to sell, so to speak. And that really comes down to vision. So the vision at Hera Hub is to support over 20,000 women in the launch and growth of their business by 2020. That is something we repeat daily at Hera Hub. And so when I'm having a conversation with a potential licensee or a potential member, it's not, oh, you should come and join us. It's here's what we're doing. Here's the impact we're looking to make. If you want to be part of this movement, then perhaps join us. But it's not a sales type of conversation. It's more of a leadership conversation. And it's worked for us. Um, again, we pivoted to the licensing model in April of this year, and I'm excited to say that we've <laughs> secured our first international licensing agreement in Stockholm, Sweden. And so we'll be opening there soon, and we have uh, four active market assessments going on here in the U.S. All right, last two. <laughs> this image turned out more like a Halloween image than uh, the one that was initially in the, uh, in the slide deck. But uh, this is an image of a bunch of women uh, kind of maybe at an Elvis concert screaming excited. So the, the idea here is, uh, engaging others, get them, other people, engaging others to tell your story. This has been a critical piece for us. So um, the examples here are two uh, different examples. So 
pretty early on, we partnered up with an organization called the Story Exchange, really phenomenal nonprofit organization that is telling stories of women all over the country um, they're on their entrepreneurial path. And that first opportunity came pretty early on into the business and landed us a spot. They had a media partnership with the New York Times. So our story ran in the New York Times and on JetBlue flights. Uh, this video they did of uh, myself and my business for four months was just an amazing opportunity and gave us some really great exposure. And so you have to, as an entrepreneur, have a story, frankly. You have to have something that's interesting, a purple cow, so to speak, that people want to share, frankly. You have to get other people excited about sharing your story for you. And the same is Another quick example here is a you know, relatively small podcast called The Art of Mindful Wealth. A uh, woman, Lisa Peterson, in Sedona, Arizona, she invited me on her podcast about a year and a half ago, and that's the podcast that my licensing um, woman in Stockholm, Sweden, heard, and that's how she found out about us. And so um, I know we're going to talk about this later. I think Dinah's going to talk about this a little bit, too, is – how can you, you know, create that story and allow people, empower them to tell their story for you? And last but not least, I alluded to this a bit earlier, it's never going to be a straight line. It's never going to be, you know, you write your business plan, which I did when I came up with the idea of Parahub, and I can tell you that probably 95% of it is different than it was when I wrote that business plan six years ago. And that's okay. That is going to happen. But if you go back to what's your vision, what's the big picture, what are you trying to achieve, and you keep focused on that. And as uh, Jim Collins, I think it was the, the BHAG goal, big, hairy, audacious goal, you know, set that goal, that bar high, so to speak, but you have to make sure that while you're focused, you're flexible in how you get there. And I, I talked a little bit about that as far as some of the vulnerability of, you know, hey, we tried this and it didn't work and we're going to try this. So that will allow you to continue to grow, but also make sure that you're flexible in the process. So uh, I've put a lot of this and more in a book that I recently released called Flight Club, a bit of my story as an entrepreneur in launching Hera Hub the ups, the downs, the the, uh, the rebel and reinvent piece, which I know uh, the reinvention conversation is a, a big one in, in entrepreneurship and how we came to this path. And sharing the stories of other women as well as in the final part of the book is a process I built an online platform called Steps to Start Up, 17 Foundational Steps to Launch Your Business. And that book is available on Amazon. So with that, Maria, I am going to turn it back over to you. Thank you, Felina. That was a fantastic presentation, and I apologize that the graphic didn't come through on that on that one slide, but it was very colorful and, and very uh, informative. So yeah, with that, you. I will now <laughs> with that I'll now go ahead and turn it over to Dinah Grossman, who is the co-owner of Sinning J Bakery and Soda Fountain on Chicago's West Side. Dinah has 17 years of experience working in the restaurant industry, and she has a number of tips for us here, um, specifically around how she's grown her business. So go ahead and take it away, Dinah. Great. Thanks, Ria. Um, that was great, Selena. I think a lot of the things that I'm going to talk about touch on a lot of those points as well. Um, thank you all of you for, for joining us today. Um, I am the co-owner of Spinning J. We are a 1920s themed bakery and soda fountain in Chicago's West Side, which is the Humboldt Park neighborhood. Um, I actually started another business about seven years ago called Cheap Tart Bakery, which was the genesis for Spinning J. It was a um, pie and pastry business working out of a commissary kitchen. And I was the only employee for about five years until I pretty much burned myself out. Um, I had the help of my then boyfriend, my now husband, um, but really it was just me alone in a kitchen every day, um, you know, 2 a.m. for eight hours there by myself, and I started to really feel like I was spinning my wheels. Uh, I wasn't getting where I wanted to go. I'm not sure I knew where I wanted to go. 
And so what we, I ended up closing and taking a step back and asking myself what it was that, um, that I really wanted to do with this business idea with pastry. That was my background. Um, when we opened Spinning J, it was as not just a bakery, but as a 1920s soda fountain. Um, we make all of our pies and pastries from scratch. Um, we offer breakfast and lunch in an all-day family-friendly environment. And we opened a little over a year ago. Uh, in our first year, we were featured in the Chicago Tribune, Time Out Magazine, Red Eye, which are local publications, Chicago Magazine, and the New York Times. And we did that with a marketing budget in the traditional sense of zero dollars. So how do you get that sort of press and how do you get your name out um, when you don't have any money? And that was I think a question that – certainly a question we had. I know a question that I heard a lot before we opened from other entrepreneurs. How do you – if you have no marketing budget, how are you supposed to tell people who you are and tell your story? Um, the, one of the ways that we look at that is look at marketing differently. So marketing is not necessarily uh, a PR company or advertising that you take out online or in a newspaper. Um, and the first step in understanding how to best market yourself is to understand what your brand is and what your business's identity is. Uh, and this ties into what Felina was saying. The question that I asked myself was another way of saying, um, another way of being a purple cow, why does the world need another whatever it is you are? So in our case, I would say to myself, what is, why does the world need another bakery? And I really needed to figure that out for myself before we could figure out what we wanted to tell the rest of the world. What is it about Spinning J that was going to be different and unique? Um, how do I tell someone on the street what our business is in one or two sentences? And why are people going to choose us over the competition? When I, one way to uh, get a better sense of who you are and what you want to do um, is to think about who your customers are. Um, we spent a lot of time researching our competition. In Chicago there are several really well-known um, pie and ice cream shops. Those are two of our biggest uh, products at Spinning J. Um, so what was it about Spinning J that was going to be different from the people who were already successful in the industry and had been around for longer? Um, what was going to be the thing that set us apart and what was going to be the thing that excited us every day when we said, why does the world need another bakery? What was the answer going to be? How do we come back to that? Um, for us, it was a couple of things. It was this soda fountain component. We were sort of reintroducing the idea of a soda fountain as a community gathering place, as an alternative to a bar. So we are a gathering place for people of all ages. Any time of day, we're open early morning to late at night. Uh, and there wasn't anything like that in our community, and really there wasn't anything like that anywhere in Chicago. So that was sort of the jumping off point for us, is the soda fountain was first in our name. Um, that was the thing that was going to help us stand apart and stand apart from our competition. We also wanted to know what collaborations we could set up with complementary businesses. And we knew that going into it, we did not have the energy or the money to make everything we wanted to sell. So we were a bakery that wanted to sell ice cream, but we weren't about to start learning how to make ice cream and doing all of that from scratch. So we looked around at what other local businesses were making ice cream, making the product that we wanted to sell, and we used that as a way to get our name out. So we ended up partnering with a business called um, Black Dog Gelato. They had been around for a long time. They had a great reputation in the community, a wonderful pro uh, product. And we met up with them. We said, this is what we want to do. Would you like to partner with us? Sell us your product wholesale. We'll sell it retail. And that ended up being one of the ways that we got people to come into our doors to begin with. They knew something familiar paired with something new. Uh, social media. So we use a lot of social media, and the great thing about it is it's free. So if you're in that situation where you don't have uh, a marketing budget, this is a great place to start. Um, what the heck is it? Social media can mean a lot of different things. In a very traditional sense, social media is Facebook, it's Instagram, it's Tumblr, it's Twitter. Um, but in our case, we also think of social media as um, how we interact with our community face-to-face. -face. 
And not all of your businesses are going to be retail, brick and mortar sorts of businesses, but it's the same idea of how you tell people your story. So how do you engage and interact with your customers? Is it face-to-face? -face? Is it through Facebook and sharing stories about the genesis of your company on Twitter and Instagram? Um, people engage with so social media for a few different reasons. They want to know basic information. Where are you? What do you do? What are your hours? What do you sell? Um, and you also want to use it to get people to take that next big step to click on your website or to go to your business to come to your storefront. And in order to do that, you have to understand how people react. So one of the things I always tell people is it helps to read about influence. People are emotional rather than rational creatures. So when you're posting whatever you're going to post on Facebook or you're posting on Instagram, it helps to think about what is the, the aspect of this post that's going to grab someone on an emotional level. So it may be that it's a great deal that you're posting, hey, we've got um, whole pies, two for one at the bakery. But what is it about the post? Is it the photo? Is it your wording? What's going to grab someone on an emotional level and get them to stop and click on your post over all of the thousands of posts that they see every day? So the way we answer that is what is it about other people's posts that gets us excited? Why do we click on other people's posts on other people's information. And when you understand what it is that gets you excited, it's a lot easier to transfer that to the posts that you're going to share with the world. For us, we're a very visual business. Food is very visual. I get excited when I see a photo of something on Instagram or on Facebook that's really beautiful but also a little bit different. I might recognize, oh, that's a, that's a sandwich. But what is it about? That, that looks different or that looks really appealing. It catches your eye because it's familiar, but there's a twist. Um, and that's the, the tack that we've taken with social media as far as um, you know, choosing which photos to post and choosing when to do it. We also use Instagram a lot over other, uh, other um, platforms because it is such a visual platform. So we use a lot of photos, and Twitter isn't as good for that. Tumblr isn't as good for that. Everyone has access to Instagram, and it is a very photo-driven platform. So that's the one we've really chosen to use. Another good thing to think about with social media is consistency. If you are not paying someone else to do your social media for you and you're taking that on yourself, it helps to be consistent. To so develop a routine. Is it something that you're going to do every day? Is it something you're going to do every week? Develop some sort of pattern and keep the posts consistent and engaging to yourself. They're going to be engaging to everyone else. I like to think of social media as um, taking a vitamin or exercising because the big social media secret that we have is that my husband and I, we actually kind of hate it, <laughs> which is we hate, we hate thinking about what it is we should do or when we should do it. So we think of it like a, a gift to our future selves, like taking a vitamin or exercising. We may not enjoy it in the moment, but we know that there's a payoff down the line, and that's enough motivation to keep us doing it every day, every week. You can also use uh, analytics like Google Analytics, Facebook, um, Yelp for Business has a tool that will help you see which of your posts, um, which information are getting people excited so that you can see who is clicking on your website. You can see who is researching your business, who is uh, choosing to pick up the phone and give you a call. And it really helps to comb through that every now and then. You don't have to do it every day. But you know, once a month, go back and look at which of your posts and which of the things you've chosen to post online are engaging people and, and grabbing them and really getting their attention. Um, that's another way of saying how much friction is there in your customer buying experience. So if you think of your customer buying experience as starting before they even come into the store or buy your product, what's going to keep them from clicking on that post? What's the friction that's not going to get them into your store or onto your website? So again, we started with a marketing budget of $0, um, and that's one of the reasons why we focused a lot on online social media. Um, we did not have a website for our first year, for example. We did not have any professional photos taken in our first year. We waited until we had um, established ourselves a little more in the community and had the money to spend on a good website, um, something that we really liked that looked professional before we got just any website at all. And that has a lot to do with the kind of business that we are. Um, we're a restaurant. 
And so it's not as important that we have a great website because ultimately people need to come into the shop and have a positive experience and interact with people and have good food. That's the most important thing for us. So having a website could wait. It may not be something that can wait for you. You may have a website, a business that really demands a web presence. Um, and that's something that you need to think about when you're figuring out where you're going to spend your money or where you're going to spend your energy. But for us, it was something that could wait. So this idea that you have to have a website right away, you have to have professional photos taken right away, you have to have all this stuff figured out from day one, that's not true. You need to figure out what is going to make the biggest impact, where you're going to get the most bang for your buck, and then save for quality. Save so that you can pay someone who is talented to take good photos, pay a talented web designer, and all of that is going to end up paying off down the line. So to sum up, um, just like Felina was saying, you've got to know your brand. You have to know who you are, what value you provide to your customers, and why the world needs another bakery or whatever it is that you are. Um, you can use social media then to build a community around you of customers, of influences, influencers and collaborators, um, and be consistent, be relevant, engage with people, um, get personal. That's what grabs people on an emotional level. And once you've established yourself a little bit and you have a little bit of money, spend wisely. Um, don't just throw it at the first opportunity that comes along. Think about, look at that, those Google Analytics, look at who the people are who are interested in your business, and figure out what the best way is to target that group. Um, and most importantly for us, and I think for any business, is don't let a customer leave unsatisfied. Um, the, most, the best advertising, the best marketing is happy customers in any business. And so making sure that customers who aren't happy right away understand that they're heard, that's going to make all the difference. Um, and those happy customers are, are free in a way, and that's going to be the best marketing tools that you can have. So I'm going to hand it now back over to Ria. Thank you, Dinah. Thank you for your great presentation. Um, so now what we'll go ahead and do is we will um, move into the question and answer portion. So what I um, wanted to make sure that we had enough time here to get to all of the questions. Um, so please, as a reminder, please feel free to type your questions in the chat box in the lower left-hand corner of your screen here. Um, again, we have had a number of questions about the slide deck and whether it will be available. Um, we will email a copy of the presentation to the email address that you use to register for this webinar, um, and it will be available for download. We'll also have a copy of the recording um, available in a, in a couple of days, so stay tuned um, and, and keep an eye out for that. This slide, we wanted to make sure that you all had um, some follow-up resources, uh, places to go to seek more assistance in terms of uh, the, the uh, topics that we discussed at Axion and Small Business Majority. Um, these resources are available here on this slide, and then I'll just keep this slide up during the question and answer portion so you all um, can have that information handy. So give me just a second here. I'll take a look at the questions and we'll get started with the Q&A. Okay. All right. So the first couple of questions here, I'll pitch over to Lauren at Axion. Lauren, I'm going to combine a couple of questions here. So the first question is, um, do CDFIs offer credit lines or just loans? And then a, a, this is a two-part question here. Uh, the second part is, does Axion provide guidance with regard to patenting endeavors? Hi. Thanks, Rhea. Um, so for the first question, I'll say that CDFIs um, are actually very diverse in the um, offerings that they provide. Um, many of them are starting to offer different types of loans and even credit lines um, in addition to their traditional offerings, um, mostly because the needs of business owners are diverse um, and they might need financing in different ways. So for example, in Axion, uh, at Axion we have um, as Rhea mentioned earlier, we're a network of um, community development financial institutions. So each of our members um, has a different, a slightly different product offering based on what they've noticed um, in, in their market that's needed. Um, I, I'm actually not 
super familiar with the specific products we provide because that's not the side of the house that I work on. Um, but what I would do is, is check out, um, for Axiom specifically, check out our website um, and look at the loan types. Um, and that will show you the different types of financing that's available to you. Um, again, some of our markets offer um, you know, more, more newer and different types of financing. Um, and, and I would also just say uh, you know, when you're looking at resources in your community um, that, that yes, many nonprofit lenders are looking at offering different types of financing from traditional loans. Um, and then the second part um, I think was a question about if we offer guidance on patenting. Um, we do uh, offer a lot of different types of guidance on our business resource portal. So if you go to um, the, the link from the slides that talks about business resources, um, we offer guidance on you know, packaging your product, branding, um, patenting is, is definitely part of that. Um, and we also have um, events uh, that, and, and workshops that, for example, um, one workshop that we offer in different communities is on packaging. And we have a, a pro bono legal uh, partner that helps um, to talk about things like patenting. Um, that you might want, that you might have to think through as you're thinking about how to market it and um, package your product. So, so I would start with our website and our business resources, and there's a lot of different types of, um, uh, of topics we cover there. Great, thanks, Lauren. Okay, all right. So, a couple of questions here for Felina. Melina, what was your biggest challenge, or what is your biggest challenge when vetting potential hubsters? Sorry, vetting potential? Vetting potential hubsters. I'm assuming folks that are looking to um, be a uh, part of the co-working um, network that um, you are. A member. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure I understood a member versus a licensing candidate. Got it. Um, so. So if somebody is interested in joining the community, they have to come in for an in-person interview with the director of that location. And we are looking for a couple things. We're looking for folks that are really want to be part of a community, are here to not just take but also give. I mean, that's what it takes to build a strong community. Um, and so. We ask members to do that through programs like hosting guru hours. Uh, if that person is a subject matter expert, they can, um, on a weekly or monthly basis, uh, for an hour or two, just be there available to answer questions of other folks from the community and the public um, around that particular topic. So we have gurus from you know, finance to uh, attorneys to social media, and then also hosting workshops. So we do weekly workshops, um, more facilitated discussions, I guess is the better way uh, to say it. And so we ask for members to volunteer their time to, again, you know, start a dialogue around that particular subject matter expertise. And there are many other things, but we really want people that are here to give as well as to receive, and so that's the main thing that we're looking for um, in our community. And we, we really just sit down and have a conversation about that to, to make sure it's a good fit on both sides. So hopefully I answered that question for, for uh, the person that asked it. Great, thank you. Okay, a couple of questions here about the marketing piece. Um, as a solopreneur, how much time, if you can give a percentage, would you recommend that a solopreneur spend on social media marketing? And either Felina or, or, or Diana, go ahead and jump right in for that one. Sure, I can, this is Diana. I can, um, I can jump in. I, I think it, it depends a little bit. If it's something that you are comfortable with, um, we spend probably no more than 10 minutes a day. Um, it really is short and sweet. People want something that's going to grab their attention, and you take a good photo, you post it, that's all you have to do. It's more about being consistent than being perfect. Um, if the technology is a little more complicated, you're not as familiar with it, and it's going to take you a longer amount of time to figure it out and figure out what you want to do, um, you may decide to bring in someone in. I was just talking to um, someone who owns an insurance company, and for his 
uh, social media, he employs a high school kid down the street who it, all this stuff is second nature for him, um, and he loves to do it. And so he can sort of, um, the, the guy who owns the insurance company can say, hey, this is what I want to do, and instead of spending his time figuring out the best way to do it, he passes it off to someone else um, who, you know, it's, it's an internship, um, and this kid is super talented, and he can figure out the best way to sort of condense that and put it on social media without the business owner having to spend the time himself. And if I may add to that, um, it really depends on the type of business. As, as was just said, the, you know, the insurance agency may not need to engage in social media as much as a restaurant or you know, a handbag line. Um, so there's a lot of dependencies. At Hera Hub, we spend actually a considerable amount of time on social media on a daily basis because we're having conversations, and I just want to emphasize that's what social media is, it should be, is a conversation, not just the small business owner posting, but, you know, as was mentioned, you know, hey, tell us your favorite X, Y, Z, you know, eliciting feedback, um, but we get a lot of people that contact us through our, our Facebook channel, through Twitter, through LinkedIn, and so the social listening has to be, you know, I would say spend as much time on social listening and responding, allocate that time as you would to actually just posting. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. We definitely take the time throughout the day to see what people are saying and commenting on. Um, but I would say for us, because we are brick and mortar, we do a lot of that sort of face-to-face. -face. So someone will see a picture and they'll come into the store, and then we end up having a, an in-person conversation with them. So the social media is definitely the starting point, but it is definitely a conversation. And I want to chime in because, Dinah, that's such an important point. I, I really want to just underline what you just said because I see a lot of small business owners, they, they don't think about you know, both the in-person and the online piece. So the way I describe social media is as bookends. It can be a great way to start a conversation with somebody, and it can be on the other side of the spectrum a great way to softly stay in front of somebody. But regardless, if you're a retail store or an attorney, you need to remember it's still about connection, people to people. So we, you know, you can't rely on that in entirety. I'm glad you brought that up. So we do have a question that is sort of related to that. Um, and so for entrepreneurs that are not tech savvy, so looking beyond online, are, are there any tools that you recommend, especially um, considering financial position? Uh, any tool specifically uh, low cost as well would be great. Um, uh, Hootsuite yeah, is helpful. I know, I so many things, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and there, there's a lot of, I, if you want to sort of condense your, the time that you're spending, um, something like Hootsuite will let you um, time uh, posts and will post them to multiple platforms. Um, I would also say you know, this is another instance where it does help to bring in other people to help you, and that can be very, very low cost or free. Um, but that getting – so you can't, you can't not do it. Um, and so if, don't think that money is, is going to be the stumbling block here. Get someone to help you, um, a student or a friend or another entrepreneur. There are people who will – teach you about this or even do it for you for free, um, but it does not need to be expensive. Okay, okay question for Felina. Felina, how did you decide to do licensing and ensure the person purchasing your license would not do anything to jeopardize your business name or reputation? Uh, they're contractually obliged not to, so that's that's part of it. Um, it's written into our licensing agreement, but it's you know much like we vet our members, we have a very extensive process for vetting potential licensees as well, and so. And we have a really good sense if somebody is going to be, you know, fit with the brand and the vision and the mission and all of that. 
Um, but we also know it's never going to be perfect. <laughs> so, you know, you have to let, allow a level of flexibility, um, you know, in each of the locations, but still hold true that flexible focus I talked about, um, but still make sure that, you know, it, the level of service, sometimes we use an analogy that we're the, the Nordstrom of co-working. If, uh, I know Nordstrom isn't exactly national, but most folks know the brand, and so, you know, when somebody has an experience at any of our locations that they have to, you know, have that same level of service and cleanliness and friendliness and things of that nature. So um, it's tricky. I'll, I'll be honest. I mean, it's not, there's no rocket science formula to it, but it's it's more of just getting a sense for who that person is and do they do they really understand the vision and mission and believe in that. Thank you. Okay, we have a couple questions here regarding um, online loans. So question here in terms of non-bank lenders providing services, what are the interest rates for the online lenders um, discussed today? So I can jump in and, and speak to that point. So um, when we talked about the alternative online lenders that have um, that are now available on the market, it's really, really important to note that in terms of what you'll find online, generally speaking, online options are more expensive than, than traditional options. So um, the online marketplace loan, which is structured similar to a traditional bank loan, uh, it, it's, a, it's a term loan, it has set ATR, it has a set monthly payment, um, that interest rate, rate will, will certainly be higher online. Um, so it's a very important point to note that what you do get in terms of speed, in terms of um, the quick delivery of the funds, you sort of sacrifice in terms of the cost. Okay. Question here. Um, I, I am a woman owner in manufacturing and mechanical engineering design. Where do I go for support and assistance? Um, it seems that when small business uh, uh, presentations happen, there is a very big focus on retail. Um, I guess what, what, we'll, um, what I can pose here too, and do, do uh, all of you, Selena or Dinah, are there specific resources that you've found have been really helpful um, kind of beyond just, just for your industry, either whether that's online or organizations that you've worked with um, that have helped in um, going your business? Uh, this is Selena. I'll chime in here briefly. Um, yeah, there's so many. We work pretty close with both SCORE and the SBDC, both that are you know, kind of arms, I guess, underneath the Small Business Administration, you would say. But uh, both organizations uh, offer a great uh, level of specific mentoring. Um, and so we, we actually bring SCORE mentors and SBDC mentors into our spaces to support not only our members but the broader community. And I have received um, some great advice and mentoring from uh, a few of the SCORE counselors personally. And most, in most cases, those resources are completely free. Um, the other thing I'll just briefly mention, uh, depending on the city you're in, is look for co-working spaces because a lot of times, like like we do, we offer some free support for the you know through the community with gurus and things of that nature. So connect with your local co-working space and find community, find folks that are out in your business. It's we always say. It takes a village to build a business, and you know, so it is find your tribe and find people that are doing things, you know, in your industry and connect with them. So we've gotten some help. This is Dinah um, from um, actually Sam Adams has I don't know how how well known their uh, program is, but it's uh, it's a program called Brewing the American Dream, and they offer. Um, Free mentor mentorship. Um, they have a couple of. Uh, uh, they call it the pitch room, where you can actually. It's sort of like Shark Tank on a very small scale. But beyond that, um, an extension of that um, is their mentorship program. Um, and one of the things that we've gotten help with um, through them is a lot of HR stuff, which I really never thought about much when we were opening this little bakery with three people. I never thought 
I would really need to figure out much about HR. But a year later, we have 15 employees, and I had a lot of questions about um, th just things, employee handbooks, and um, you know what happens if you lay someone off and they file for unemployment. Questions that I would never have dreamed I would need to figure out a year ago. Um, they've got a great mentoring program, and they can sort of direct you to any aspect of their business. I mean, Sam Adams is huge. So their HR program will help you if that gives you any sense of the, the scale. Great. And I'll also chime in here. Um, uh, Felina mentioned the, the Small Business Development Centers. The SBA also does uh, support a network of women's business centers. So there are uh, organizations that are on the ground in communities across the country that are focus specifically on women uh, entrepreneurs and providing resources and education and support. Um, I'll post the, uh, the link to the Women's Business Centers here, but encourage you all to take a look to see if there's one in your area. Okay, and I'll just ask, let's see here, let's just take two more questions and then we'll go ahead and wrap up. Um, one question here, so with regard to your business plan, um, and I'll, I'll pose this one to Felina and and Diana, again, with regard to your business plan, how closely did you follow it? Um, if applicable, how often did you have to tweak it? Uh, I'll chime in here. This is Selena. Um, as I briefly mentioned, I didn't. <laughs> I probably think 95% of what I mapped out in the beginning um, was different. I mean, there were core principles of the business that you know, I followed, but so much evolved so quickly as a business owner. So I actually, and this is not going to be a popular thing with a lot of people, but I actually, I, you know, at Hera Hub we help folks start businesses, and I don't recommend the 40-page business plan anymore. I, we do we use a kind of lean canvas model, one-page business plan. That's step number two of the steps to start a program that I developed. Um, because so much changes. So um, really, I mean, do your research, know your competition, you know, know what makes you different. I mean, those are critical pieces. But I, I really think that the long-form business plan, unless you're going to get a traditional bank loan, is, is probably not the, the angle I would take in this day and age. Yeah, we we strayed also significantly from our business plan. Um, I would say it's most useful um, for yourself in terms of honing your brand and figuring out how what's really important to you and how you're going to sell your brand to someone else. Um, so the act of actually writing your business plan might be the time when it's most useful. Um, and after that, it may sit in a file and not get a lot of, of play. But um, definitely doing market research, um, detailing what your business is going to look like, who you're going to hire, all those things were helpful for me to write down in the planning process. Um, and after that, a lot changed once we actually opened. Um, but I'm certainly glad that I had that um, and went through the process of creating it. Great. Thank you. Okay, now what we'll now we'll just wrap up here, and I do have this this one last question here, and I think it'll just help us sum up um, some of what we've talked about today, and hopefully leave you with some some advice um, as you go off and do what you do best in running your business. So the question here is, what is your last takeaway point or one piece of advice that you would like to leave women entrepreneurs with um, as you're as they're growing their business? So I'll go ahead and, and get started here. So, so my first my point, um, I would definitely encourage you to um, to reach out to your local resources. So there are so many organizations like Small Business Majority, like Axion, um, that are committed to you know their sort of whole purpose is to help small businesses on the ground. So definitely reaching out to the resources um, and, and building your network from the ground up is is something that I would leave you with. I definitely agree with that. Yeah. Go ahead, Diana. Sorry. I, yeah, this is Diana. I definitely agree with that. Um, and I, I might just add that um, going back to asking yourself that question of 
um, what is it that makes you unique and why the world needs another one of whatever it is you're doing, asking yourself that every day and staying excited and passionate about what you're doing will make those meetings with other people a lot more productive. I'd say a lot of the best um, meetings I've had with people or connections I've made have been with people who are equally passionate about what they're doing. Um, and it may be that they're doing something completely different from what I'm doing, but it's that shared passion um, that will really sustain a relationship and you'll, you know, you'd be surprised what can happen. Um, just maintain that excitement about what you're doing. And along those lines, this is Felina, I'll, I'll definitely add to that. It's uh, one word for us that comes up a lot at Hera Hub is confidence and just having the confidence to know that you can do it. And I will say because, again, we primarily serve female entrepreneurs, um, that's an area that we continue to work on strengthening because these are amazing, accomplished, fantastic women who don't need to go get one more degree to do what they're doing. They know, you know exactly what they're doing. It's just, as was said, find the supportive community and have the confidence to know that you can, that you can do it. And just to add a tiny bit to that is, you know, again, the flexible focus, but stay the course. Don't just don't give up. It's business is challenging, and it, finding the support is critical. But you know, keep at it. Keep going. Um, you can do it. Um, and this one, I would just echo what everyone has said already. Um, there really are a lot of resources available. Um, and one thing I would say in terms of confidence is um, really don't be afraid to ask for help, whether it's from your local small business development center, um, a local community development financial institution, or even someone who owns a business um, in your neighborhood who you admire. Um, a lot of the business owners that um, I've met through my work at Axiom um, really did just that. They just asked, you know, can I volunteer? Can I shadow you? Um, and they really found that helpful um, as they thought through how to start their own business. Great. Great. Thank you, ladies. Uh, so with that, we'll go ahead and wrap up. Again, we will make a copy of the slide deck available to you. It will be emailed to you and within the next hour. Um, you can go ahead and download that. Um, thank you so much to Felina, Dinah, and Lauren for our, the fantastic presentations today. Um, we are actually, we've gotten uh, incredible um, feedback and incredible response to this, this webinar that we are actually holding a part two of this, uh, this National Women's Small Business Month webinar, which will be next, um, next week, October 25th at 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern. And we'll discuss um, different topics as well as uh, other tools and resources for women entrepreneurs. So stay tuned for that email as well. Um, with that, thank you so much for joining us. And this will conclude our webinar. Take care.